Francisco nasceu em 1936 em Glasgow, na Escócia, é poeta, ensaísta e pensador. Doutorou-se pela Universidade de Paris em 1963 e foram-lhe atribuídos vários doutoramentos ao Maris Causa, nomeadamente pelas Universidades de Glasgow, de Edimburgo e, bem, e assim também, e também pela Open University. É membro honorário da Royal Scottish Academy. Ensinou a literatura francesa na Universidade de Glasgow até 1967. Foi leitor de inglês na Universidade de Londres. Foi professor da Universidade de Paris 7 entre 69 e 83. Em 1983 foi nomeado professor da Universidade de Paris Sorbonne, onde viria a ser responsável pela cadeira de poética do século XX. Em 1989 funda o International Institute of Geopoetics, promovendo aí um novo campo de estudos transcultural e transdisciplinar. Foi galardoado com vários prémios, Alfred de Vigny em 87, Roger Caiuá em 98, o prémio Ardla em 2002, o um conjunto da obra, o prémio Edouard Brissan em 2004, o prémio Price em 2006, o prémio Grinzan Biamonti em 2008 e ainda o prémio da Academia Francesa Maurice Genevois em 2010. Kenneth White tem-se desenvolvido nos últimos anos, o, nos últimos 30 anos, o domínio e o conceito de geopoética. É autor de inúmeros uh, livros e estudos sobre as intersecções entre a cultura humana e a percepção da Terra e da sua geografia, abrangendo dimensões filosóficas, simbólicas, materiais e ambientais. A presença do sobre literário, assim como a influência do seu pensamento, tem vindo a apoiar-se em várias línguas e continentes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, before actually beginning, uh, since the idea, one of the ideas is to record these proceedings, so with some kind of continuity or maybe even permanence, let's try and regulate a couple of technical questions before actually going into my going into my talk. Could we, for example, and I don't know whom I'm addressing for this kind of thing, could we try to get rid of the thumps that you can hear all the time? Like me, you've had all these thumps. I don't know where they come from. Can we get rid of them? Because they're a hell of a nuisance. <laughs> Is it possible to get rid of them? Oh, okay, no. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know what okay. to do. So just imagine it's a kind of cosmic music. 
Right. One other little thing. Uh, could we agree to put all cell phones yeah. on the closing position, right? Okay, because that's also a bit of a nuisance for everybody. And I know it's difficult because, okay, but it would be good if we could do that. Okay, uh, so let's, uh, apart from the technical things, <laughs> there's, a, okay. there's, a, there's a physical thing. Uh, I was a bit disturbed with having this machine in front of me because it prevented me having a face-to-face -face contact with my auditors, which I always like to have. So somebody in the audience very kindly removed that <laughs> useful machine, <laughs> but I'm glad it was done because I like also to speak from within a space. And when I say that, Paula, don't be disturbed if suddenly I make huge gestures. You know? I just, I'm just trying to make them in that direction. <laughs> okay, Felix. Right, okay. So here we go. Then. Is that if I talk at this distance from the Miku, does everybody, everybody hear? Even a way back there? The, in the distance, okay. Is that a good, good talking distance? Okay, right. Okay, right. So, before launching into my theme, I'd like to say just how glad I am to be back here in Portugal. This isn't the first time. To be back here in Portugal at Lisbon, and I want to thank the initiators and organizers of our colloquium for inviting me to do this lecture this evening. I'm going to present it in three parts. The great lines of the earth, the question of world, and philosophy and poetics. The great lines of the earth, the question of world, philosophy and poetics. The great lines of the earth then, first theme. The title of this Portuguese colloquium, As Linhas de Terra, I'm doing my best, <laughs> The Lines of the Earth, immediately appealed to me. It was right up my street. When I started up the geopoetics movement more than 30 years ago now, to follow the lines of the earth, Suivre les lignes de la terre, was one of the first precepts I proposed. Follow the lines of the earth, the lines of the earth. One of the principal books in my Atlantic library, because it's situated on the Atlantic coast, but also because it has a kind of Atlanticity to it, like uh, the library of some great minds I know across the world. So one of the principal books in that library is The Physical Atlas of Natural Phenomena. The Physical Atlas of Natural Phenomena, published by Alexander Keith Johnston in Edinburgh in 1850. A wonderful one. An atlas based largely on the, and here I quote Johnston, the profound and various researches, I love that phrase, the profound and varied researches of Alexander von Humboldt, who was one of the predecessors, if you like, of geopoetics one of the great predecessors, Alexander von Humboldt. That's really a, a primal mind at work. In that atlas, one finds charts of the mountain systems of Europe. You, you get a sensation of the whole mountainous area of Europe. The river systems of Europe, America and Asia. The movements of air currents, across the globe, winds, meteorology, and a physical chart of the Atlantic Ocean. Aesthetically beautiful and intellectually strong. I turn to this book frequently. It's my Bible, if you like. Yeah, it was very close at hand all the time. I turn to it frequently so as to keep the total context in view, because we get mixed up in little things all the time. To keep the total context in view and to maintain the feel of it, the sensation of it. Intelligence and sensation go together for me. And what I'm 
really talking about all the time is poetic intelligence. That would be the most general term. Geopoetics being obviously part integral of this. One of the lines, speak of lines, this is our theme. That's lineage de terra. One of the lines that mark our particular area of the globe, when I say our particular area of the globe, I'm thinking beyond nations, I'm thinking of a total physical context. One of the lines then that mark our particular portion of the globe is what has been called the Atlantic Arc, which stretches from the, from the north of Scotland at Cape Wrath to the south of Portugal at Cape Sagres. That's the Atlantic Arc. Over the years, while moving elsewhere across the globe, that's part of my activity, I don't, never, never intended to cover the whole globe, but several parts of it. I've travelled that Atlantic arc from north to south, from south to north, and for long years now I've been living in the middle of it, almost exactly in the middle of it, on the north coast of Brittany. That's my base, it has been my base for the last 30 years. And I'm always interested in how people are based where they are. A lot of people don't know where they are. You've got an address, they don't know where they are. A residence, this place of mine on the north coast of Brittany, and everybody can be thinking, okay, what is my place of residence? Where, how do I feel about all this? A residence that after a great deal of errancy, which is at one at the same time, <coughs> a place of concentration and an observation post. Also a, a scriptorium, like in the old monasteries, where I write several types of book, several types of book. I, I mentioned the word residence. There's a, there's a dialectics in my whole work between errancy and residence. You know? uh, I study in my workroom so that my travelling isn't just running around the globe, but has a density to it. And if I travel, it's to concentrate on a lot of elements and work at them in the residence. So that's, there is a basic dialectics of errancy and residence. So we've been talking quickly, but not abusively, I think, of the Atlantic Arc. To use in passing a metaphor, I don't abuse metaphors. Some people think that poetry is all metaphor. No, not at all. But to use in passing a metaphor, which is a fast made of moving from one topic to another, and that's a metaphor. That's a metaphor like a lightning flash. If we translate arc, the Atlantic arc, into bow, it's the same word in, in French. If we translate arc into bow, we get to bow as a means to release an arrow. Right? Now, an arrow can do more than hit a target. To hit a target is relatively easy. All you need is a bit of skill and training. An arrow can do more than hit the target. It can much more significantly, in other words, a bearer of signs, significance, it can more significantly open up a space, indicate a space. That's what an arrow does. It indicates a space, not only hitting a target, that's secondary. Now it's that, it's that space I'll be exploring in this lecture, the rediscovery of the world. But before rediscovery, let's speak of discovery. It's like people who talk about postmodernism who don't know what modernism is. In other words, they're talking nonsense right from the beginning. So before approaching rediscovery, that little thing re is very difficult. Before approaching rediscovery, let's speak of discovery. Now, there can hardly be a place more propitious for any talk of discovery than Portugal. I'm referring, of course, to the great maritime movement of the 15th, 16th centuries, the discovery of the so-called New World. The name, in, to my mind, is almost ridiculous. The discovery of the so-called New World, which, as a French commentator, David Jacques, puts it, earned Portugal such a magnificent page in the history of the world, and that's indubitable. But 
before yielding to bedazzlement and rhetoric, as is very often the case in commemorations, I have no interest whatsoever in commemorations, but very much interested in memory. Before yielding then to bedazzlement and rhetoric about the great discoveries and the new world, let's never forget, and I'm sure many people in this audience don't forget it, but elsewhere many do, These discoveries, in, in inverted commas, were accompanied by a ponderous ideology, a ponderous, really heavy ideology. Hardly had an island been discovered that it was immediately covered with imported, superimposed names, those of kings, of queens, and saints. The examples are, are thousands, and I'm sure you have many in your minds. If this was not blatantly and dominantly the case, as it was, the as yet unknown, the as yet unknown, was immediately integrated into the familiar by analogy or homology. New material was put into the old bottles, according to the, to the old phrase. An island, to give, it, to give concrete examples, I'm almost giving, almost out to give concrete examples. An, an island named by the Portuguese Dio, already an analogy, is taken over by the French as Il Dieu, Portuguese Dieu, French, translated, not translated, transliterated, by the French as Il Dieu, which is a small island, small island of the west coast of France. Again, the, the as yet unknown is integrated into the known, and that's deadly. That is anti-discovery. To confront the unknown is difficult, obviously, but it's the only thing that really matters. This, this possessive toponymy, naming things, that's a poetic gesture, how to name a thing. I mean, it's, it's much more interesting to, to, to name a street, uh, the street of the red carnations, than to say the street of uh, General so-and-so. Uh, that is an unpoetic way, and therefore an non-existential way of naming a street, for example. This possessive to not properly then was the precursor. The, that's where the hell begins. Was the precursor of what followed: colonization, colonization, conversion, colonization, conversion, and often brutal exploitation. We know that, but it's, a lot of people forget it. Or else they beat their breasts for a while because that's you know, a good, a good thing to do and then business as usual. The picture then, for somebody with close insight and outside, gets uglier and uglier in fact. More and more deformed till it becomes the norm. So that rather than while admiring them, while enjoying deeply the, the diaries of some of the great navigators, I prefer, in fact, to think of more discrete sea movements from Portugal out, out to the Azores, for example, or along the west coast of Africa, such as one can see outlined in the Elucidario of Joaquim de Santa Rosa. These are books which I have in translation, obviously, in this Atlantic Library. Or we can think of the Saudades da Terra of Gaspar Fructuosi. Or the biography of Henry the Navigator by Joseph Freire, another Portuguese, who signed himself, by the way, with the delightful pseudonym Candido Lusitano. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's the most beautiful pseudonym, nom de plume, if you like, in literature. Candido Lusitano. Before refinding space and the sense of open world, you, you'll find me insisting on certain words, it's because they're, in my estimation, keywords. Before refinding space and the sense of open world, needing other wording, other working, 
than any new world with big capitals, which is the biggest caricature on earth, I propose to remain for a while in the framework of history. I move, I've done a move, I've tried to do a move from history to geography, if you like, but I don't forget history. An observer of history and society, history and society, they go together. An individual can transcend them, but society is largely historical. An observer of history and society can hardly be in Lisbon, and I'm always talking to the places which I find myself, can hardly be in Lisbon without thinking back to the earthquake of 1755 that caused, as you know, the quasi-annihilation of one of the most prosperous and cultivated cities of the time. Now, leaving aside the, the sensational and emotional aspects of the event, abundantly documented by historians and novelists and actors and whatever, let's look rather, more interestingly, into the mental commotion this event provoked. Enveloped in a metaphysical religious tissue, it was all wrapped up in religion, enveloped in a metaphysical religious tissue, tissue multiple questions were being raised all through, throughout Europe because of this Lisbon disaster. Questions were raised as, the, as to the teleology of the mind providence. I mean, does God really have a plan? <laughs> they put it in simple terms. The teleology of divine providence. The instability of the constructed world. Are all constructions unstable? <laughs> yes. And the fragility of humanity. Voltaire, the author of Candide, Candido, Candide, that text, you probably know the, the book by, by Voltaire, Candide, a text written against excessive idealism and optimism, wrote a poem about it all called Le Désastre de Lisbonne. About that uh, idealism and optimism, I'm sometimes asked by journalists, are you, uh, Kenneth White, are you an optimist or a pessimist? I say neither one nor the other. It's impossible to be optimistic. <laughs> that, you have to be very naive for that. Uh, but it's too easy to be pessimistic. You know, just say, just twirl your thumbs and say, oh, to hell. Uh, so, too easy. So I say that I'm neither pessimist nor optimist, I'm a possibilist. Right? <laughs> now, if I, if I dwell here a little on this event, 1755, Lisbon, and its problematics, it is, I submit, I propose to, to you, because something of the same is in the air today. Confronted by events, it's not, the, it's not the disaster of the Lisbon, it's the disaster of the moment. Confronted by events such as Hiroshima, Chernobyl, or Fukushima, more and more aware of the pollution of the planet, there lies, I submit, I analyze, deep in the human consciousness today, hardly to be satisfied <laughs> by a multitude of distractions and gadgets, we're in a world full of distractions and gadgets which prevent any, anything like real thought and anything like real life, real living, to use a more live word. There is then this deep anxiety, unsat unsatisfied deeply by distractions and gadgets, and little convinced also by, especially at this particular moment, a lot of well-meaning politically ecological discourse, well-meaning. I mean, I'm deeply into ecology from the age of about 15. I was reading Hegel, he he Hegel, the guy who invented the word. Some people think ecology started up 20 years ago. No, it goes back to the middle of the 19th century, but nobody was listening at the time. So, there is this anxiety, sometimes expressed by pathological violence, that's the always it's the daily paper in, in every country practically, it's fermenting in the psyche as nightmare or phantasm, I mean think of the cinema, 80% of the films produced today are phantasms about the end of the world and so on and so forth. And deeper down still, really deep, deep down, which we really get to, the fundamental possibility 
of the complete loss of a living world. And that's a possibility. Now, for the hyper-technical futurist <coughs> science, and there are quite a few of them, there are more and more of them, in fact. For the hyper-technical futurists among us, of course, this is no problem. The fact that the, the, the world may no longer be a place for complete existence, shall we say. For these hyper-technical futurists, this is no problem. Humanity, humanity will create another world for itself, another planet. Then maybe I listened to a, I listened to a scientific program. No, it was a, it was a colloquium of scientists, and I've been invited to, to talk in other terms. But uh, these, some of these futurists, hyper-technical futurists, were uh, quite coolly saying that this is no real problem. There, there may be a little question of adjustment. I mean, on some planets, it may be advisable to have human beings short and round. On, other, on others, long and thin. But again, no problem. No problem, man. No problem. Genetic manipulation will do the trick. Put the things here and there. And artificial intelligence will do the rest. There are a lot of people in this world thinking already in these terms. They're not only thinking in those terms, but developing the technology that might make it possible. But frankly, I don't really care to live on the moon in a, in, a, in a sort of zoot suit made of metal or whatever material they use. No. My place is the Earth. It's here on Earth. It's to this Earth that I'm biologically adjusted. It's on Earth, than this Earth, I can make the most interesting developments, not by going to the moon. I, see, I hear kids saying, oh, I want to go to the moon. I hear adults saying, I want to go to the moon. Okay, go to the moon. Fuck off. <laughs> and let us get some living. <laughs> now, there's one of the last phrases pronounced by Nietzsche, one of his last phrases, I mean, this very live intelligence, one of the last phrases pronounced by Nietzsche at the end of his life and work, brothers, remain true to the earth. Does it still have any sense? I think so, yes. But seeing certain events, and following certain developments, one might ask the question, does one of the last phrases then pronounced by Nietzsche, brothers, remain true to the earth, does it still have any sense, any operative sense? That brings me to my second theme, the question of world. There's a relationship between earth and world. Earth is the basis for world, and world should always be able to think back to the earth. Right? But again, there's a kind of dialectic between Earth and world. World. Like all simple words in common usage, the term world is not easy to define. Like all simple terms, it's very difficult to define. In English, this word world goes back to the Germanic Weltalt, Weltalt meaning an age of man. The way things are, the way things are. That's the world. This is the world. This is the usage of the term. This is the world the poet Wordsworth in the 19th century had in mind when he wrote, and I'm quoting Wordsworth, the world is too much with it. It's the world in which we're enclosed in a category. You're in a category from the beginning and you're going to stay in it. You may be making progress, but we're in the within the category. It's the world in which we're enclosed in a category, in a social function, and work according to limited codes. More and more limited codes. We will get me siege now that are all codes. Very soon we'll be living a, a, a life full of codes. Everything will be coded. And you'll be spending your life doing codage. Unless you think twice or thrice. A lot of kids are already into it. It's a world in which, existentially, the mind is full of half-thoughts, because it's difficult to think things to the limit. Half-thoughts and confused sentiments, that's the psychology thing, confused sentiments, beset by tedious obligations. To come back to the to Wordsworth poem, it's a world, he says, where we lay waste our powers. We lay waste our powers. Nietzsche's will to power, by the way, which is 
caricature you and caricatured and misunderstood in, in horrible ways. He made the will to power to this kind of power. We lay waste our powers, not pouvoir, but puissance, okay? To use a French vocabulary, which is not pouvoir. The, the non puissant the, doesn't want pouvoir. He's above pouvoir, right? He has a kind of, with his power, he has a kind of generosity, rather. <coughs> That's Nietzsche well understood, which is not frequent. So it's a world where we lay waste our powers in getting and spending. Getting and spending. I mean, there's a whole system trying to turn every individual, and I'm always addressing individuals, into consumers. You know, uh, the power of buying, buying and selling. Think of the publicity, which is hammered at you day in and day out, hour after hour, minute after minute. That's power coming at you in insidious ways, right in the middle of a film, which may be a lousy film, or even a good film. You're going you're gonna to get a quarter of an hour publicity, sometimes hidden publicity. A world then in which we leave waste our powers and getting and spending and are, and this is a phrase much deeper even, out of tune. We're out of tune, we're out of harmony. If we look to the Romance languages, there I was talking English if you like, or Germanic if you like. But if we look to the Romance languages, Spanish, Portuguese and so on, if we look to the Romance languages, we have for world, we have moon, Mondo, mundo. All going back to the Latin mundus. That's the root. Mundus. Now in the beginning, in the founding of a city, this word mundus designated a place in which future citizens, future inhabitants of the city, would deposit a handful of earth from those territories their original territories, and this mundus, containing handfuls of earth from the territories, indicated a source of original forces to which the citizen could have recourse from time to time. It was gradually lost. It became simply a ghostly place. Right? But in the, at the beginning, it was a place of existential power, right? and a reminder of the territories of the earth, very often lost in the developments of cities. Thus, this mundus at the beginning maintained the contact, maintained that essential contact between earth and world. As to the Greek mundus, uh, or cosmos, to use or uh, refer to another linguistic context, as to the Greek cosmos, it meant originally a beautiful whole in movement. That's a cosmos. A beautiful whole and movement. And that's worth thinking about. Nowadays, cosmos is used, and I think you'd agree with me, it refers only to interstellar space. Cosmos is what's up there, uh, which is very soon going to be filled by all kinds of things from one level drones and a second level uh, technological uh, machines, and then above that. God knows what. But it's happening. A beautiful whole in the world. Nowadays, it refers only to interstellar space, or in its aesthetic sense, survives only in cosmetics. Ah, nothing against cosmetics, but cosmos is something else. But this, that's how the, a word, a strong word, is devaluated and enters into its normal usage in deformed ways. Which means that linguistically you have to really try to go up to the origins in order to get the full sense of the word. In a book that meant a lot to me when I was a student, and I know I'm speaking in a university. In a book that meant a lot to me when I was a student, this was a German book, Entdeckung des Geistes, Hamburg, 1948, published in English translation as The Discovery of the Mind. I'm not to referring to this for nothing. Published by in English by Harvard University Press in 1953. Bruno Snell. Bruno Snell traces the rise and development of thought in ancient Greece. 
That's his example. Notably in the poetry of Homer and in the earliest philosophy. In, in the Greek, Paideia or Paiduma, there is politics, but politics would descend into mere manipulations without the oceanic poetry of Homer. Every Greek discusses politics in the Agora, but in his head he has the oceanic poetry of Homer. That was the, the strong moment in Greek culture. So Snell tries to get back into that original territory. Uh, the discovery that he works at is a question of vital experience, vital experience, that's always the basis, then of a conceptual lexicon. It's good to have a conceptual lexicon also. I'm not against it by any means. I'm not against concepts. But let them be live concept, concepts. The classical humanistic conception and translation of certain original concepts is, says Snell, and I, I agree with him, I agreed, agreed with him when I was a student, studying, among other things, Latin and Greek. The classical conception and a translation of these concepts is totally inadequate, totally inadequate, says Snell. An uncovering Rediscovering kind of work must be undertaken. This is Snell, 1953. It's like, it's like with an old painting. In order to get at the original brilliance, you know, a painting, you say, painted in the 16th century, it's going to be very dark, right? In order to get at the original brilliance, you have to scrape off layers and layers of varnish. Oh, I wait to see the original painting. Otherwise, you're not seeing it at all. And this is what Snell tries to do with language. Showing, for example, again, I'll give you a few examples. How to get at the full sense of comprehension, understanding. Let's say the full grasp of the totality of a moment or a phenomenon. Moment in, in, in temporal in a temporal context, phenomenon in a physical context. In order to get at the, the, the original sense of that word, that, yeah, that word, comprehension or understanding, you, you have to start out from various verbs, you study in Greek, from very, notably in Homer, you have to start out from various verbs meaning see. In other words, understanding begins with, in Homer with sight, seeing things. How to really see things. Likewise, starting out from a word like soma, you know, usually, you know, like say, psychosomatics, it usually just means body, right? But that's a limited sense of the word. Starting out from a word like soma, in, in, in Homer, that means limbs in movement. Limbs, arms, legs in movement. That's Homer. He never, he hardly ever talks about a a whole body, but a, a limb in, in movement, a, a gesture, a running, a walking, whatever. And a word like psyche, which has to be in integrated into, obviously, psychology, is in fact close to breathing. To have a psyche which is alive, it has to breathe. <coughs> Otherwise it festers and turns into pathology. And gradually, by doing this, uncovering, this discovering. You can come to precepts like teorain. Teorain means, in fact, a, a procession of precepts. You can come to the con concept of nos, knowing. On the basis of this semantic geology, you can enter, finally, into a territory, an intellectual territory, an existential territory, more powerful than, for example, so much talk of soul or identity into a field of energy. We've heard so much about identity recently. I don't think at all in terms of identity, but of a play of energy. It's when there's no play of energy that you become obsessed with identity. 
a field of energy situated far beyond any discourse, and God knows we've been enveloped in this kind of discourse for a long time, discourse based on the established division of mind and body as if they could be separated, subject and object as if they could be separated, concrete and abstract as if they could be separated. But we've lived for a long time in that kind of discourse. It was on the basis of studies such as these, philological, linguistic, conceptual, that I myself began to work out concepts that seemed to me necessary in the socio-historical context I found myself, in which we find ourselves. Concepts such as, and I'll only give a few of these concepts, there's a, a dictionary at the moment of all these concepts I started using at one, at one time, it's still used. Concepts such as supernihilism, chaoticism, biocosmopoetics, literality, archipelization, also assumed in the word geopoetics. I don't want to go into all these words. If the, these words interest you, as I say, there is online a dictionary, and there's recently just one, two or three days ago, one published on paper. Now I present and develop these concepts and others in my essays. But what I want to do here is give some conceptions of an experience, an itinerary. In the first instance, at the beginning of my own itinerary, and everybody can, can think of this for himself, herself. In the first instance, at the very beginning of my own itinerary, I felt I could situate myself nowhere. I felt that no situation satisfied me. I, I couldn't be satisfied with the situations proposed to me. I, I felt I could situate myself nowhere, in no position, I wanted no position, no category. I wanted no category. That's, for example, one of the reasons why for years and years and years I avoided the word poet. Because the word poet has so many stupid connections, connotations that I prefer to avoid it. So when people say, uh, are, are you a poet? I would say, look, I just, I just work. If the work interests you, go into it. <laughs> Don't put a ticket on me. Don't put a label on me. I never say, I am a poet. No. So, let's see, finding you, not finding yourself in any category, in any social situation. Okay. I remember reading, and I'm mentioning some books that were important in my own itinerary. It's up to you to decide for yourself. I remember reading when I was a student of modern languages, classics and philosophy, at the University of Glasgow. That was my university. A university, like we said in passing, uh, that saw the first analysis of capitalism, which is not nothing. The first analysis of, of, of capitalism was done at the University of Glasgow by a man called Adam Smith, the wealth of nations. And an analysis of capitalism, some people present him as uh, an apology of capitalism. No, no, he was interested in, in its mechanism, but he is, and you only need to read his essays, accompanying the wealth of nations to see just how deeply against it he was. But, okay, that was in parenthesis. In the last, in the ninth and last volume of Arnold's, of Arnold Toynbee's study of history, entitled The Prospects, The Prospects of the Western Civilization, this is 1954. That's when I first went up to university. Now the prospectus, as Toynbee sees them, 1954, in other words, nine years after the 45 war, which saw the beginning of the slump of England, by the way. England saw that ideas could be dangerous. I mean, Hitler had ideas and it to go on. So England decided it was safer not to have any ideas at all, which is one of the reasons why I left Great Britain and went to France. <laughs> went to Europe, in fact, which is an old Scottish habit. You know, you go, to, you go to France, Belgium, the Balkans, Russia, and you bypass England. That's the line I've tried to develop, Scotland and Europe. So, the perspectives, and one has to think also in perspectival terms, the, the perspectives as he sees them, Tony, are to say the least not happening. He looks around him in 1954, we're now a few years further on, a catastrophized terrain, psychic disaster, and a culture that does little but the name. A pseudo culture, if you like. 
we, we really don't have a culture at all at the moment, but we have a plethora, a massive plethora of cultural products, something entirely different. Now, if, if he himself takes refuge, Toynbee, in a kind of Franciscan spirituality, that's the temptation today to do, to do this kind of thing. He sees, he sees vaguely, Toynbee sees vaguely, you know, he's sort of looking through a telescope. He sees vaguely some kind of exit from this context to be undertaken by, and here I quote him, certain navigators on the waters of history. Certain navigators on the waters of history. I'm keeping to my metaphorical context who, like those Ionian mariners of the 6th century before our era, were ready to leave their homeland, their habits, and set out beyond the pillars of Hercules, not so far away from here, confronting the unknown immensity, the monstrous nothingness of the Atlantic Ocean. Another book read with interest by me as a student was The Destiny of Civilizations by Leo Frobenius. That was 1924. In other words, just after the 1418 war. A lot of questions, radical questions, are often put after wars, which is understandable. Which means you don't need to wait for wars to think deeply, <laughs> fortunately. Frobenius, Frobenius follows the movement of civilization from its mythological stage. He's maybe over-precise here, but it's interesting. His mythological st stage, he, he situates the mythological stage in Africa and the Pacific. <clears throat> Into its religious stage, Asia, e Asia Minor, the Eastern Mediterranean, shall we say. Its philosophical stage, that's the Mediterranean. Into its techno-economic stage, which is the Atlantic, the Atlantic shore. That's where the techno-economic civilization, industrial, etc., 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 started up. And this latter stage, this is where Frobenius again is sort of feeling his way out. This latter stage, this Atlantic stage, is marked by rationalism, positivism, industrialism, and capitalism. That's, a, that's a, in three or four concepts. The, the discursive basis of our state of civilization. Rationalization, rationalism, turning into rationalization. Rationalism, positivism, Kant, for example, in France, it exported massively to South America, for example. Positivism, industrialism, and capitalism. And capitalism has been around for a long time, and it's liable to be around for a long time more, because it has all kinds of tricks in its bag. You think it's finished? No, no, no. Finds another way. Now, if this stage, this Atlantic stage, arose and developed on the rim of the Atlantic, it's in that area, suggests Frobenius, and I was all years, it's in that area, that Atlantic area, according to the thesis of Frobenius, that the first signs of an ill ease in civil, an ill ease, ill ease in civilization, Freud's title, das Unbehagen in der Kultur, the ill ease in civilization. It's there that we'll see the first symptoms, not only of an ill ease, but of a dis-ease, a disease. That crisis of one type or another will become endemic, one crisis after another. And perhaps, perhaps, this is my possibilism, the first elements of a new Paiduma, a new thinking, a new culture, able to integrate elements of ancient cultures either lost, neglected, or practically destroyed, except for fragments. Now, it's with studies such as these by culture historians, able to think in terms of large lines instead of just weighing up pros and cons. It's with those thinkers in the background that I discovered and developed the theory and practice before geopoetics of intellectual nomadism. Now for a quick definition, a very quick definition, because I wrote a 300 page book on this. For a quick definition, definition <coughs> says, the intellectual nomad, who is also a nomadic intellectual, is not the idealistic intellectual of Plato, 
who remains within the realm of ideas. He tries also to intervene politically, but it's excessively idealistically. Nor is he, so he's not the platonic idealist. Nor is he the intellectuel engagé of Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, who intervenes in social reality. This is, this is the philosopher intervening in social reality, feeling he must be engagé, must be engaged. Often, I would say, over hastily. He intervenes uh, without really knowing the terrain. So in fact, he can actually create situations worse than the bad situation that was there at the beginning. The intellectual engagé is very often a bit simplistic. Sympathetic, but a bit simplistic. Even less, the nomad intellectual is even less a more recent phenomenon. The mediatic intellectual, uh, who comments week in, week out, on the events of contemporaneity. This is perhaps more a French phenomenon than, than exists elsewhere, but I think it's, uh, it contaminates. The intellectual nomad, in distance and in silence, these, these are essential conditions for, I would say, any really deep going work. The intellectual nomad, in distance and in silence, knows how to be silent when it's necessary, which doesn't prevent speaking in other contexts. He crosses, or she crosses, territories and cultures, territories and cultures, in order to discover and gather the elements of a new field of energy, which implies experience, thought, and language. Experience, thought, and language. They all go together. He may also, or she also, may be an author. Now again, I use that word with a sense of its etymology. The word author comes from the Latin augeri auctum, augeri auctum. An author, then, in my conception of the word, is one who augments. And who augments what? Who augments the sensation of living on earth. Who rediscovers the world. That's an author in the full sense of the word, according to my conception. The word author, in my lexicon then, goes well beyond the banal connotations of writer or poet. Mm -hmm. Rimbaud in the 19th century was saying, uh, thousands of writers, but never an author. That was Rimbaud. As author, I've been invited to talk a little about myself here also. As author, I write three types of texts and books. Essay, narrative and poem. Now, if we think back to the image of the arrow, which I used at the beginning of this talk, it's, I would say it's possible to present this triple writing activity in terms of an arrow. In terms of an arrow. The, the feathers of the arrow that give direction, those are the feathers. The, the narrative, largely consisting in, in moving about the world, that's the, that's the stem of the arrow. And the poem is the arrowhead. So this, this triple writing activity I often present as an arrow in the sense of just evoked. The essay, which I conceive of as a quick type of thinking. Uh, I mean, even my, even my long books tend to be a series of essays. A quick type of thinking, that's the feathers then, giving direction, and then the narrative and the head of the arrow of the poem. And this reference to the triple activity with the arrow as the poem, the arrow head as the poem, brings me to the third and final part of my talk, philosophy and poetics. There is a general assumption, a general assumption, little examined, like a lot of assumptions, that philosophy is somehow more serious and consequential than poetry. I think you'll agree with me that a lot of people think that way. Now, if we, go, if we go beyond banal practice on both sides, banal practice of poetry, banal practice of philosophy, this will be seen, like so much else, as an illusion. In one of his lesser-known texts, René, de, René Descartes, René Descartes, the, the inventor, by the way, of modernity. Modernity didn't begin 50 years ago, didn't begin in the 19th century, 
Modernity goes back to the 17th century. The discourse of modernity is invented by René Descartes in the 17th century. He said, okay, he's uh, a methodical and mechanistic ultra-rationalist. But this man says that a poet can go faster and further than a philosopher. That's René Descartes speaking. It's not any poet. The compiler of that 18th century compendium of knowledge, the Encyclopédie of Denis Diderot, another author whom I much admire, says that, this is Denis Diderot, author of an Encyclopédie of Knowledge, an Encyclopédie of Knowledge. He says, poetry is after something enormous. Something enormous. Now again, by that word, enormous, I understand two things. I understand enormous as both immense, which is the usual sense, but I understand it also as outside the norms. Enormous as immense, but also as outside the norms. In more recent times, the most interesting th work in philosophy, in my opinion, the most interesting work in philosophy has consisted in attempts, I'm going to say it brutally, but I'll go into nuances later, in attempts to get outside philosophy, philosophy as practiced, shall we say, since Plato, shall we say. And this, is this has taken place, again I'll take a specific example, this has taken place most singularly, singularly and consequentially, I would say, in the work of Martin Heidegger. The philosopher of the Black Forest, following meditatively its path, begins by presenting philosophy as poetry as two mountains, both on their heights, facing each other, but not mingling. An interesting enough remark, but which does not go far enough. Heidegger then concentrates on philosophy itself, saying that its worst enemy, the worst enemy of philosophy, is das Philosophieren, das Philosophieren, which we might translate as philosophantism. Philosophantism. It's to remedy this elephantiasis of philosophy that Heidegger turns to poets. He knows his philosophers in the palm of his hand, but when he's really in the furthest context of his thinking, it's the poet he looks to. It's poets he looks to. Not any poet. <coughs> Those with the energy and scope of a Hölderlin or a Rilke, for example. If some of his interpretations, some of uh, Heidegger's interpretations of poets are a bit over, over the top, shall we say, they can be doubtful. The essential thing is to see him, via that poetry, moving towards something that had as yet no name. And he comes in the by going to, really, to replace the concept and practice of philosophy with what he calls anfeinliches denken. Anfeinliches denken translates this as a beginning thinking, a thinking concerned with a new beginning, an originalization, one might say. And in one of his later books, Die Erfahrung des Denkens, Die Erfahrung des Denkens, literally translated, The Experience of Thought. But in that word, in German, Erfahrung, you've got the verb fahren, which means to travel. Language can really be very, very interesting. He says then, in Die Erfahrung des Denkens, The Experience of Thought, when you look at the vocabulary, The Experience of Thought, one finds this. It's made up. Somebody like uh, Lady Stoss in one of, the, uh, one of the talks given earlier on today, there was mention of Lady Stoss. Now, Lady Stoss was a philosopher, uh, but he gave up philosophy because he said, I, I can do philosophy. Give me, give me an hour and, do, and I'll do philosophy. I can do it. <coughs> but that's why he went to ethnology, because he felt at least he was in touch with some, some kind of living reality. He was not simply doing philosophy, he was ex experienced the thought of your life. The found this thing. Then he says this, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this phrase twice. The poetic nature of thought, the poetic nature of thought, hasn't yet been discovered. That's what discovery is coming in all the time, as you've noticed. The poetic nature of thought hasn't yet been discovered. Wherever it appears, it will seem for long like some kind of poetical intellectual utopia. In reality, it is the topology of being. 
Now, nobody in the philosophical field, I think, to my own knowledge, has come closer to geopoetics. A few years, again another example, because I remember the first, uh, the first uh, presentation of our colloquium was geopoetics and geophilosophy, so I felt I had to talk about geophilosophy. Uh, and that, of course, is Gilles Deleuze, who, by the way, I say it in brackets, was on the jury of my own uh, thesis a few years back. So after, a few years after I launched the notion of geopoetics, in a chapter of one of his later books, 1991, Qu'est-ce que la philosophie? What is philosophy? The philosopher Gilles Deleuze began talking about geophilosophy. What is philosophy, this book, is at one and the same time a sort of anatomy of historical philosophy. He does anatomical work on the corpus of philosophy and the testament of a modern philosopher. There's an existential thing in this book. Uh, it's a testament of a modern philosopher. Now, the, the first question Deleuze puts himself in that essay is this. In what sense can Greece, if, if the fact that when we use the word philosopher, we tend to think in terms of ancient Greece. And so he asks himself, in what sense can Greece really be considered as the land of philosophy par excellence and the ideal terrain of the philosopher? His thesis is that the Greek city-states, and it's an interesting thesis, that the Greek city-states, both commercial and maritime, they were both commercial and maritime, were close enough to and far enough from the archaic empires of the East to profit by them without having to follow their model. It was a historical geographical situation. They were like, if you like, an international market on the rim of the Orient, whose merchants and artisans could experience a liberty and a mobility totally unknown in the archaic empires. It was into this context that the first philosophizers appeared from Greater Greece, from what we now call Turkey and so on. It is into this context that the first philosophizers arrived, I think the man who invented the word philosopher was Heraclitus, arrived, fleeing the strictures of the empires, free to enjoy the satisfaction and pleasure of friendly association and open discussion, asking questions, inventing concepts about the nature of nature and the organization of a state. Great. Such was the image up, shall we say, to Hegel. Hegel, doing for modernity what Aquinas had done for the Middle Ages. In other words, he tries to build a summa, summa philosophica, if you like. As Aquinas had done a summa, summa theologica. He does a summa philosophica, with a kind of conceptual cartography, the phenomenology of mind and his thesis concerning the end of history. Again, I don't want to go into, I can't go into Hegel in any detail, but those who are interested in what I have to say there quickly can see it all develop in my books. In the multifarious, often pathological, post-Hegelian context, the philosopher has at his disposal a plethora of contexts allowing infinite, infinite permutation and combination. Among others of the calling profession, Deleuze can manipulate them. Brilliant, brilliant. But he's hardly satisfied with this kind of operation. What to his mind is desperately lacking is what he calls, thinking perhaps to Ionian Greece, is, I'm quoting the French, a plan d'immanence, a plane of eminence. Deleuze would spend a large part of his work moving at high speed almost deliriously at times through the codes of capitalism and the labyrinth of schizophrenia, but never finding that plane of eminence. Only once did he seem to be approaching it, in my view. That took place in chapter 9 of what is philosophy, entitled Geophilosophie, in which he has recourse, via the work of the historian Fernand Brodel, on long duration and spatiality. This historian moves into geography. With some of its approaches and formula, I easily concur, since they are part integral, elementary, of geopoetics. 
Here, for example, is its physical, geometrical description of Greece, I'm quoting Deleuze. It would seem that the land of Greece has a fractal structure. Every point of the peninsula is close to the sea, and the coasts are long. Then there's this. Geography doesn't just supply matter and variable locations to the form of history. It is not only physical and human, it is mental. And this, more specifically still, intellectually and conceptually, subject and object give a poor approximation to thought. Thought is neither a thread drawn between a subject and an object, nor a revolution of the one around the other. Thought develops in a relationship to terrain and territory. Thought develops in a relationship to terrain and territory. Now there, we are very close to geopolitics. But this, in Deleuze, is not developed at all. The essay on geophilosophy, in what is philosophy, ends on a rather plaintive appeal, yeah, rather plaintive appeal to, in inverted commas, I'm quoting, a new earth and a people that does not yet exist. Now formulated differently, such as a rediscovery of the earth and a new anthropology, we are there approaching the field of geopolitics. That was never my intention in this lecture to provide a summing up of geopolitics in all its amplitude, in all its perspective. That was not my purpose here today. I've done that elsewhere in books such as Au large de l'histoire, Au large de l'histoire, Offshore of History, and Le Plateau de l'Albatros, the Albatros Plateau. But in fact, in fact, I've been getting at geopoetics in one way or the other throughout this talk, as you probably realize, because you know something about it. Now, at the beginning, I evoked the precept of geopoetics, follow the lines of the earth. To conclude, I'll align three others, releasing them to pick up in one of my original images as arrows. First arrow. <laughs> Second arrow, vroom. third arrow, vroom. these are the three arrows. Boom, boom, boom. Good job, you're away. <laughs> now, first arrow, okay? And these are precepts, quick precepts to get into jibwins. Information, information, exformation. Information, we've never had more of it than today. But to have your head full of a lot of information is really not going to get you very far. It will be useful in certain very limited contexts, but it won't get you very far. It's only if you enter into information. In other words, when you begin to, to select, when, when you begin to integrate information into your mind, in your, into your growing mind, that you can really begin going somewhere. That's information. As to exformation, we always have to remain in mind that all our knowledge is half knowledge. We don't really know that much. It's good to know something, at least, huh? but all our knowledge is half knowledge. And how much you know, in order to really get at something deeper and larger, you have always to go back to the void and chaos. You, you, you have to sort of risk now and then going out of your conceptual framework, framework into the void and chaos. These word voids and void and chaos, they come into my books all the time. Second R, <laughs> landscape, mindscape, wordscape. Landscape means an experience of territory, that's landscape. Allied to the scope and scape of a new mental configuration, that's mindscape, landscape, mindscape. And these two are allied to the need for new expression, live expression. Live expression, ultimately transparent and simple, ultimate, ultimately. So that's the second arrow, landscape, mindscape, wordscape. Third arrow, eros, 
Logos, Cosmos. Eros, that's life energy. That's the, that's the original meaning of the word Eros. Which can include eroticism, but it's more than that. It's life energy. Logos, Logos, that's more than logic. Logos has got sort of sub-translated into logic, but it's much more than Logos. Logos, says Heraclitus, one of these pre-Socratic philosophers, pre-Platonic philosophers, shall we say, or thinkers, thinkers, says the Logos, you'll never really get to the end of it. The Logos is impenetrable. That's Heraclitus. Then Cosmos. Cosmos, as I said before, is a beautiful whole in movement. So the third arrow is Eros, Logos, Cosmos. So I leave you with these three arrows. Information, information, exformation. As quick, quick definitions of Jude Wedding. Information, information, exformation. Landscape, mindscape, wordscape. Eros, Logos, Cosmos. Having done that, what I felt I had to do on this occasion, whenever I do a lecture, I like to speak to a place and to a context. <coughs> Having done then what I feel I had to do, it only remains for me this 21st May 2019 at Lisbon <coughs> on the banks of the Taj facing the ocean to thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you so much for this very <coughs> challenging conference. You touched so many key points and issues of our contemporary situation. And uh, I think we, we have much to, to think and to rethink about what you said, you just said. And maybe we can open a, a short period of uh, questions or commentaries. Podemos abrir um... Estamos muito atrasados, mas uh, será importante termos a possibilidade de fazer alguma questão, algum comentário à conferência que foi feita. Let, let me say, before we perhaps begin a, a to and fro, uh, I never judge the success of a lecture by the number of questions. Um, because I know very well that a lot of people don't like to ask questions. They like to go away and mull over things in their own heads. Having said that, if anybody wants to put a question to me, I'll do my best to, to answer. I'm, I'm open. But don't forget what I said at the start. So that will be total silence. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is not bad either. Right? At least I have one question. Yes, if you don't. Ah, of course not. I found very interesting what you said about identity and the lack of energy. I don't know if I understood uh, well, but uh, it seemed to me that you said that when we have a lack of energy, we immediately uh, feel concerned more or more concerned about uh, or with identity. Is that correct? It's, it's a large part, sure. A large part. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would like uh, would like to ask you if you could uh, comment or uh, something more on that. And also, if uh, there's some connection between this and uh, your concepts of void and chaos. Yeah, well, your two questions are encyclopedic. <laughs> yeah, identity. Uh, again, if we examine the word, if we do a, a, some geological work in this word, identity has in it ends being, uh, being, which is a philosophical context, uh, concept. Uh, I would say, and I, I think my companion here at this table might agree with me, uh, a lot of radical thinking over the last century, as we, said, as we might say, maybe, maybe less than that, has gone from being to existence, uh, being to existence. Uh, because being is, the that's identity, you're, you're enclosed in a definition. That's identity. And people sometimes want 
to be enclosed in identity because it's comfortable. It's a comfort zone of, thought, of thinking. Whereas existence, I'm not talking about existentialism, but existence, existence, uh, means going outside the box. Okay? And going outside the, the box, you're going to be in, to in contact, and here it comes to the second part of the, of the question, you're going to be in contact with a whole lot of energies. Right? So it's not simply a lack of sort of personal energy. This, what I've called the field of energy, is uh, being in, in, in contact with the, the totality of the play of energy in the cosmos, on the earth and in the cosmos. It's that, it's, 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 a, it's a larger field, it's a, uh, a larger field of living and of thinking outside identity. Is that, is that clear enough? Absolutely. No? Absolutely. I'm at your disposal. But, as you like. What I want to say is that I was away at the back of the hall uh, right from the beginning, not understanding everything. But there will be translations, and I'll, I'll be reading all these texts. Uh, what I was hearing was the, the music of Portuguese. Uh, and also I had the feeling of sort of, the very sound of the language, I felt myself sort of traveling on a kind of river, you know? <laughs> it was very pleasant. <laughs> so although I didn't understand, I was getting something. I was getting something. <laughs> and I, and I, I also want to say that I thank all the speakers. And I'll thank those who, We'll be doing the same thing tomorrow. Uh, yes, uh, uh, <clears throat> leaving aside the problem of the relationship between earth and world, yep. how do you sense the, 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 the transformation of the representation of earth in several cultures? Because some cultures don't have what we call a earth representation as we have. Sure. So, how do we sense these, these differences? Are they geopoetically productive or interesting? Those. I said that the intellectual nomad crosses territories and cultures. Uh, I can be interested, for example, in the mythological representations of the earth, which you'll find in some cultures. I can be interested in the religious uh, representations. I can be interested in the metaphysical representations. But, but, uh, I don't think, I mean, we don't, we don't live in mythology. We can study mythology, but we don't live in mythology. So there's no way of going back to the mythological representations. They can be beautiful, and I would respect them as that. But we, we just can't do that anymore. It's just, and and it, it would be bad also, as sometimes happens, to enclose natives, uh, in inverted commas, this is the word that's used, within the mythological representations held by their ancestors, but which they no longer want to be enclosed in. The Ab Aboriginals, for example. I know Aboriginals who, you know, who, who says, wow, well, we can't go back to the old guys. And to put it very, very simply. Religious representations. I can, I, can, I, I, read, I can read a lot of religious literature, especially in the Middle Ages. Why? Because uh, the bright minds, sharp minds in the Middle Ages, they couldn't think anywhere else but in religion. Uh, I mean, I'm interested in people like Duns Scotus, I'm interested in people like Eric Gena. Uh, I'm interested in people like a <coughs> German philosopher who said, who, who said uh, in the Middle Ages, right in the middle of the Middle Ages, you have to go beyond God into the desert. And that's, you're in the middle of religion then. That's the kind of thing that you know, rings a bell right with me. Metaphysical conceptions of the earth, well, that would be apart from, you know, God created the earth and so on and so forth. 
mythological plus plus religion giving a cosmogony. Uh, <laughs> I'm from I'm from metaphysics with a lot of physics. <laughs> in other words, I leave out the, the meta. Just as in, 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 to use another go into another religious con context, that of Buddhism, which has interested me vastly for from a long time. Because Buddhism is interesting for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that there's, there's no God, there's no self. I mean, a Buddhist talks about this so-called self. There's no identity there. There's none of these, none of these concepts. So that for years in Paris, I, I ran a seminar, East, East and West, you know, to show the differences there. I, I'm for a, I, I don't think it's possible to say and I think my companion might think in those terms, but maybe not. I would never say, although I've stu studied Buddhism, Buddhism maybe, maybe less than my companion, maybe in the, same, in the same way. I would never say I'm a Buddhist. Because there's no I in Buddhism, and there's no ism. So I'm interested in a Buddhism that drops Buddha and ism. <laughs> and that's the void. That's the void. So you're killing the Buddha. Killing the Buddha, right? As in Zen, you, yeah, you kill the Buddha. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Which is very close to the guy in the Middle, in the middle Ages in Germany. Uh, go beyond God, Meister Eckhart. <coughs> go beyond, go beyond God into the desert. Why? Wow, that's tremendous in the Middle Ages. I mean, he risked a lot. Yeah, you can say it's a content, yeah. And then you speak of thinking outside the box. Yeah. But isn't geopoetics a box? No. <laughs> it's a field of energy. <laughs> it's outside the box. Okay. Huh? And okay, let, let's, let's say two or three words about this word geopoetics, which is, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a long literature about it, so anybody who's really interested has access to literature. But if you look at the internet, you're going to see the word geopoetics everywhere, used in all kinds of uninteresting context, to be polite. I mean, it's, it's used all over the place. But that's inevitable. I knew when I started this notion that it would be picked up, like, like the word surrealism. You know, all, all the journalists in, uh, on the radio or uh, on television, you know, they'll use the word surrealist for all kinds of occasions, which, which are only fantastical, or, or vaguely <coughs> charmed. No, so geopoetics is something else. Geo, let's take the geo. Every culture, and I'm trying to bring the questions together, every culture has a central theme, a central image, a central preoccupation. If you go back to Paleolithic or Neolithic culture, the preoccupation is the animal. Look at, think of the painted caves. It's the animal. It's the relationship between man and the animal. That's the centre. Uh, think of uh, religion, Western religion. There you have God, the Virgin Mary, and the child. That's the image in the Middle Ages. Everybody thinks in those terms. But what, what makes for a culture that everybody thinks in the same large terms? There could be all kinds of individual correlations and so on. But everybody thinks... <coughs> so I asked myself at one point, I'm, go, I'm going fast here. I asked myself at one point, is there anything that we can all agree, east, north, east, north, south, east, west, is there something that we can all agree, in, agree on outside our mythological paths, our religious convictions, uh, leading to all kinds of conflicts, as you know, and more and more, and there will be there will be more and more. Is there something we, we can all agree on? Well, I would say it's the earth in which we, we try to live. That's the geo. You, you might say that human being the human being has actually very rarely lived on earth. Very rarely. Either either the human being has lived like this, with 
face up to heaven. Think of the Gothic, Gothic uh, churches. <laughs> huh? uh, or, or more recently, more modern, if you like, instead of this, you have this history, history leading to progress, unending progress. So it's either been up vertically or horizontally. What I suggest is that the best ways to live is not vertically or horizontally, but in concentric circles. So to get into geopoetics, <coughs> you, you start where you are, wherever that R may be. Yeah? Whether in Lisbon or somewhere along the Portuguese coast, that's where you start. Try to get in touch with phenomena. Huh? And then, gradually, one circle after another. Concentric circle <coughs> as, a way, as a way of living. As to poetics, well, that's a word that for centuries has been <laughs> really misused. But poetics for me, again, example, if you go back to practically the, the beginnings of humanity, in other words, to shamanism, the poetry is presented by the, the songs of the shaman, the poems of the shaman. If you think of Greek culture, you have the oceanic poetry of Homer. If you think of the Christian religion, you have the Psalms. So with the word poetics, what I was after, or the meaning I give to that word, is, 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 has the same kind of power as those concepts which have just evolved. In other words, a power to carry a culture. It's, the, it's poetics that ultimately carries a culture. So geopoetics, not a vague geographical poetry as some people, but geo in a strong sense and poetics in a strong sense. Okay? Se calhar temos que ficar por aqui. Temos aqui com um problema sério de horários. Há um, há um filme ainda. Quanto tempo é que durou o filme? É... It's 41 minutes. Okay. Uh, ah. I can speak to for like literally three minutes, I think. Okay. Sim, sim, vamos. So we'll show the show the show. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for being here. Thank you. <laughs> some kind of continuity, you know, it's just a, it's not a one-time thing, you know, it's, it's, it's a moment in time which can expand.